Hello and welcome. Uh, I am so glad that uh, we have been together from the first topic up to now we are now looking at the last topic. So I welcome you to this very wonderful topic that we'll be looking at and this topic that we are looking at is uh, the African independent churches. African independent churches. So in this topic, we are going to look at a number of issues. In this topic, we are going to start by explaining what these churches are. When we say African independent churches, what are they? Then we are going to look at the factors uh, that prompted to the formation of these uh, African independent churches. Then from there, we are also going to look at some of the notable uh, African independent churches and the people who started it and the reasons why they started those churches. Then we are going to look at the importance, the impact of these African uh, churches in uh, the uh, nationalism or in relation to nationalism, that is uh, the fight for independence. So we are going to look at the African independent churches in Malawi, the African independent churches in Malawi. So let's be together. Let's move through together up to the end because this topic is not very long. It's very short. So we are going to uh, look at these factors in detail so that we understand them better. So let's move on together. The African independent churches, African independent churches. Now let's look at the meaning. What do we mean when we say African independent churches? So when we say African independent churches, these were churches which were formed by, the, by Africans as breakaway churches from conventional European established churches. So you have to understand it in this way to say, they were churches that were formed by Africans as breakaways, meaning to say they were churches. Now, what were those churches? We mean those European established churches. So it was like Africans, uh, they were in those churches established by the missionaries that we just looked at. Then they broke away. Uh, and formed their churches. So those ones, they are called the African Independent Churches. So let us look at the factors. What were the factors that led to the formation of African Independent Churches in Malawi? What were uh, the factors? Number one, uh, desire to save African interest from uh, abuses, uh, of the colonial government by criticizing it through the Bible. So these Africans who formed their churches, they wanted to uh, form a platform where they would be criticizing the colonial government through the church, through the Bible, through the Bible. And number two, uh, Western education enabled some Africans to develop critical minds such, a, such that they were able to uh, reconsider the status of the white man and resist uh, and injustice or ill treatment, for example, John Chirembe. So here what we are saying is that the Africans, they got education. Now with that education, they were able to criticize some of the uh, other things that the whites were doing. For example, uh, uh, on the status of white people, they were regarded as very, very, very high people and uh, resist. They were uh, uh, practicing racism, racism, and also injustice and any uh, and re resist uh, on the other hand, resist any injustice or ill treatment. So they wanted to resist. To resist is to reject. To reject any any things uh, that were uh, bad or ill treatment. 
So John Chirembo is one good example who uh, fought for uh, the injustices by the whites. And also misunderstandings in terms of uh, church doctrines, teachings and culture. For example, physical forms of baptism, that is uh, immersion or sprinkling of water. So the question, also the question of the day of worship. Should it be the Sabbath, that is Saturday or Sunday? So those things, the doctrines, we are talking of the doctrines or teachings. They are the ones uh, that brought up misunderstandings between uh, the uh, Africans and the, the whites. Hence, they formed their own churches. They also resented, they rejected the practices of uh, European missionary controlled main churches. For example, segregation in the European churches. Africans were treated as second class Christians. So there were some malpractices that were taking place in the missionary controlled churches. So we are saying, number one, there was segregation in the European churches. So uh, Africans were treated as second class. Number two, uh, we are saying that the Africans were exposed to long period of catechumenical or catechumeni, many, many. Uh, that is the teachings, uh, the teachings before someone attends uh, maybe full graduation or full membership or full, or full confirmation. So uh, there was long period of teaching and confirmation. So for instance, we're saying blacks or the Africans, they took long to be baptized or to become clergy. So those who were attending maybe theological schools, they were taking long to be confirmed as the, the pastors. So that one, they were Africans were not happy. And also introduction of the church membership fee in 1901. Uh, uh, this one was headed by Africans. And also condemnation of some African practices such as polygamy, beer drinking, uh, uh, traditional dances, uh, birth and death rites, and drum beating. So all those they were condemned by the whites as, as such. Africans, they were not happy. They said, no, this is our culture. This is our tradition. Why should we stop? Why should we stop uh, beer drinking, polygamy, uh, all those things? So uh, they did not want and they formed their own churches. Now let us look at the examples of independent churches in Mao. Examples of independent churches in Mao. Number one the providence industrial mission pim it was started by john chirembe in 1900 so it was founded by reverend john chirembe after returning from america we talked about uh, john chirembe visiting america uh, by joseph booth or under the sponsorship of joseph joseph booth and others so there he attended the theological studies he studied the Bible and became a pastor. That's why he's called a reverend. So the church, uh, the church came due to land, tangata, rent, taxation, low wages, and exploitation of Africans by Europeans. So we see to it uh, because of uh, the conflicts that were there, then the church, it was formed in order to represent Africans in the abuses that were there by the uh, uh, the whites there or the the government itself so the church became very important why was it important the pim was important number one because it provided the forum for discussing uh for discussing the general plight of africa or of the people so we see to it that it was like a forum for discussion on the things that concerned africans and number two, the politics and plans of action against the whites were discussed. So apart, apart from uh, teaching the Bible, uh, also they were also talking about politics and plans of action how, on how to uh, uh, rebel against the government. So they were also discussing those things. So it has to be noted here that the problems of PIM and the estate manager of Bruce uh, estate eventually culminated into Chirembwe uh, revolts. So remember, we talked of William Jervis Livingstone, the manager of Bruce Estates. He was the one 
uh, who was uh, against uh, Chirembo and his actions. So uh, with the, uh, the ongoing conflict, it resulted into Chirembo uh, revolt, uh, Chirembo revolt in 1915. Now, uh, here we are. We are now looking at the uh, African Seventh Day uh, Baptist Church of Charles, Charles Domingo. African Seventh Day Baptist Church of Charles Domingo. That is the second one we are looking at now. So this one, uh, Charles Domingo, he was a Mozambican from Kwerimani uh, who came as a, a servant to Dr. Laws, Dr. Robert Laws. Uh, and Charles Domingo had studied theology at Kondowe and he became uh, the first critic of the Livingstonia in 1901. So you can uh, wonder to say, how come a Mozambican uh, from Kwerimani and doing it here? Uh, so number one, you have to understand that Charles Domingo, he was a servant of Robert Laws. Remember, when they were coming here, these people, they were using the Zambezi, uh, entering uh, through Mozambique there and up the Shire River like that they were using uh, that route so uh, that's why they had those servants from Mozambique so uh, he studied at Kondowe and became the first critic we are saying that one so Domingo had contacts with the Joseph Booth who influenced him although Booth was deported in 1904 for advocating Africa for Africans, Africa for Africans. So Joseph Booth, he was a white, uh, a white person, a white missionary, but he was advocating to say, no, Africa has to be for Africans. Domingo disagreed with the, the whites on two accounts. Number one, Saturday was the day of worship and not Sunday. So that's what he said. And again, the whites ill-treated the Africans. So with that, then he disagreed uh, with the, the, uh, the whites uh, missionaries. The third church that we are going to look at is uh, the Watchtower Movement by Elliot Kenan Kamwana uh, uh, Masokwa Chirwa. So Elliot Kenan Kamwana Masokwa Chirwa, 1907. So Kamwana was born in 1872 and attended Livingstonia Mission Schools. So you have to be taking note there that uh, these people, as we have said, the people who started their own churches, they first attended the mission schools. They first attended, they were taught by the whites, but later on they rejected, they started to criticize the things that the whites were doing. So they were not just following because I have been taught by him, therefore I just need to follow everything, even the wrong thing. So here we see they were really critical. They learned something. And he migrated to the Shire Highlands where he met Joseph Booth as well, who later sponsored him to go to South Africa. So we see to eat Joseph Booth. Uh, he did a lot. He's one of the heroes who is not mentioned in the uh, history of Malawi because he, he supported much of the, 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 the Africans. Now, in South Africa, he received instructions in the Watchtower teaching and became a staunch convert, that is Kenan, Kenan Kamana. He later joined the Watchtower uh, Bible and Tract Society also known as the Jehovah's Witness, the Jehovah's Witness. Now let us look at the preachings of uh, Eliot Kenan Kamana. He preached about true baptism of total immersion. Total immersion is to dip someone in the water, as opposed to uh, white's baptism by sprinkling. So he said, no, sprinkling cannot be the baptism. Baptism should be by immersion. People have to be immersed in, in the water. So he also preached of the millennial messages. That is the future glory, uh, great happiness, and prosperity for everyone. So in his teachings, it was a futuristic preaching to say uh, one day all the people are going to prosper. There is going to be great happiness and glory is coming in the future. He also preached against taxation and he was 
against church contribution, which he considered as a form of taxation, to say no. If you say offering, offering, that is taxation. No, stop uh, uh, that thing of, uh, of offering. And he also preached against, he preached against the introduction of fees in mission schools. He preached to say no fees in the mission schools. He also preached that people were buried on earth for good when they die. He further promised free education uh, for all. So he said, uh, no, people when they die, they are buried in the ground there. There is nothing like something like the spirit going up or somewhere. No, people are buried in the ground. That's what he was preaching about. And he said, yes, uh, even education itself must be uh, free for everyone. And he prophesied of the coming of the uh, new age in 1914, when the British rule uh, would end and oppression would be a thing of the past. So it was like maybe predicting the uh, coming of the Second World War, which broke out in, the, uh, in 1914, which is the next topic that we are going to look at. So, uh, uh, come on, I said, in 1914, uh, there is no more the British rule. So within the first few months of 1909, he won more than 10,000 followers from the Tonga in Katabe, Ngoni, the Henga, and the Tumbuka in Rumpi. So Mzimba, Katabe, and Rumpi, they were the impact area of his church. So he won about 10,000 uh, followers who followed his preaching. Now, let us look at the reasons why Kamana's church was very popular. He managed to uh, gather 10,000 people, 10,000 followers. Why? Number one, it was because most people were already frustrated by their failure to get into the church school due to the stumbling blocks like the uh, admission fee. So, remember, uh, Kamana said, no fees in school admission must be free. And also generous accommodation uh, his movement offered. So uh, he accepted, he baptized anyone who came forward without any special condition or discrimination, uh, whether financial or moral condition. There was nothing like that. He just he accepted, welcomed everyone. So that was a generous accommodation of his movement. And also because he preached about political grievances in religious guise. So uh, he preached against taxation. Remember, he said, no taxation. Uh, even in the church, we don't do offering because it is like taxation. So no taxation. People must not be, uh, uh, must not be taxed. So it was like he was against the taxation of the government, but he was doing it in the uh, form of religion. So people liked him. And also his millennial approach, uh, uh, his millennial approach to preaching uh, attracted many. For example, he uh, preached that Jesus Christ would come in 20 or uh, in 1914, and uh, uh, the colonial rule will come to an end. So, uh, because of his teachings, then he attracted very, very uh, uh, big, big population of the people. Now let us look at the reaction. How did the colonial government react to the preaching of Kamana? Number one, Kamana was deported in, 19, in 1909 uh, to Mauritius, uh, then Seychelles, till uh, 1937. Then the Watchtower movement was banned. Uh, no more Watchtower movement in, uh, in Malawi. After his release in prison in 1937, he was not welcomed as a member of the Watchtower. So you can see things now changed. Uh, because he went out for quite long, uh, he was outside there. Then the Watchtower uh, uh, movement was still there in disguise. But when he came back, uh, he was not welcomed in the Watchtower movement. Why did the Watchtower society not welcome Kaman? Number one, uh, because he was suspected of practicing politics. Uh, but then, what was his reaction to that? Uh, he formed Mikaere, Mikaere Church, a distinctive version of uh, usual African Watchtower Church. So, the emphasis of this uh, church was on God and Mik uh, Mikael, uh, that is the angel. So, 
when he was expelled from the church to say, no, you are no longer welcome to the uh, Jehovah's Witness, he formed the Mikaere Church. Thank you.